Chapter 4. Something Lost, Nothing Found One day when Lena had been a messenger for several weeks, she came home to find that Granny had thrown all of the cushions from the couch onto the floor, ripped open the corner of the couch's lining, and was pulling out wads of stuffing. What are you doing? Lena cried. Granny looked up, wisps of sofa stuffing stuck to the front of her dress and clung to her hair. Something's lost, she said. I think it might be in here. What's lost, Granny? I don't quite recall, said the old woman. Something important. But, Granny, you're ruining the couch. What will we sit on? Granny tore a bit more of the covering off the couch and yanked out another puff of stuffing. It doesn't matter, she said. I'll put it back together later. Let's put it back now, Lena said. I don't think what's lost is in there. You don't know, said Granny darkly, but she sat back on her heels looking tired. Lena began cleaning up the mess. Where's the baby? she asked. Granny gazed at Lena blankly. The baby? You haven't forgotten the baby? Oh, yes, she's, I think she's down in the shop. By herself? Lena stood up and ran down the stairs. She found Poppy sitting on the floor of the shop, enmeshed in a tangle of yellow yarn. As soon as she saw Lena, Poppy began to howl. Lena picked her up and unwound the yarn, talking soothingly, though she was so upset that her fingers trembled. For Granny to forget the baby was dangerous. Poppy could fall down the stairs and hurt herself. She could wander out into the street and get lost. Granny had been forgetful lately, but this was the first time she'd completely forgotten about Poppy. When she got upstairs, Granny was kneeling on the floor, gathering up white tufts of stuffing and jamming them back into the hole she'd made in the couch. It wasn't in there, she said sadly. What wasn't? It was lost a long time ago, said Granny. My father told me about it. Lena sighed impatiently. More and more, her grandmother's mind seemed caught in the past. She could explain the rules of Pebble Jacks, which she last played when she was eight, or tell you what happened at the singing when she was 12, or who she danced with at the clothing square dance when she was 16. But she would forget what had happened the day before yesterday. They heard him talking about it when he died, she said to Lena. They heard who talking? My grandfather, the seventh mayor. And what did they hear him say? Ah, said her grandmother, with a faraway look. That's the mystery. He said he couldn't get at it. Now it is lost, he said. But what was it? He didn't say. Lena gave up. It didn't matter anyways. Probably the lost thing was the old man's left sock or his hairbrush. But for some reason, the story had taken root in Granny's mind. The next morning, on her way to work, Lena stopped in at the house of their neighbor, Evelyn Murdeau. Mrs. Murdeau was brisk in her manner, and in her person, thin and straight as a nail. But she was kind in her unsmiling way. Until a few years ago, she'd run a shop that sold paper and pencils. But when paper and pencils became scarce, her shop closed. Now she spent her days sitting in her, by her upstairs window, watching people on the street with her sharp eyes. Lena told Mrs. Murdeau about her grandmother's forgetfulness. Will you look in on her sometimes and make sure things are all right, she asked. I certainly will, said Miss Murdeau, nodding twice firmly. Lena went away feeling better. Th that day, Lena was given a message by Arben Schwinn, who ran the Cali Street Vegetable Market, to be delivered to Lena's friend Cleary, the greenhouse manager. Lena was glad to carry this message, though her gladness was mixed a little with sadness. Her father had worked in the greenhouses. It still felt strange not to see him there. The five greenhouses produced all of Ember's fresh food. They were out past Greengate Square, at the farthest edge of the city. Nothing else was out there but the trash heaps, great, moldering, stinking hills that stood on rock ground and were lit by a few floodlights high up on poles. It used to be that no one went to the trash heaps but the trash collectors who dumped the trash and left it. Now and then, a couple of children might go in there to play, scrambling up the side of the heaps and tumbling down. Lena and Lizzie used to go when they were younger. They'd pull out the occasional treasure, some empty cans, maybe an old hat or a cracked plate, but not anymore. Now there were guards posted at the trash heaps to make sure no one poked around. 
Just recently, an official job called Trash Sifter had been created. Every day, a team of people methodically sorted through the trash heaps in search of anything that might be at all useful. They'd come back with broken chair legs that could be used for repairing window frames, bent nails that could become hooks for clothes, even filthy rags, stiff with dirt that could be washed out and used to patch holes in window blinds or mattress covers. Lena hadn't thought about it before, but now she wondered about the Trash Sisters. Were they there because Ember really was running out of everything? Beyond the trash heaps, there was nothing at all, that is, only the vast unknown regions, where the darkness was absolute. From the end of Diggory Street, Lena could see the long, low greenhouses. They looked like big tin cans that had been cut in half and laid on their sides. Her breath came a little faster. The greenhouses were her home, in a way. She knew that she was most likely to find Cleary somewhere around Greenhouse 1, where the office was, so that was where she headed first. A small tool shed stood beside the door to Greenhouse 1. Lena peeked in but saw only rakes and shovels, so she opened the greenhouse door. Warm, furry-smelling air washed over her, and all her love for this place came rushing back. Out of habit, she gazed up toward the ceiling, as if she might see her father there on his ladder tinkering with the sprinkler system, the temperature gauges, and the lights. The greenhouse light was whiter than the yellowish light of the ember street lamps. It came from long tubes that ran the length of the ceiling. In this light, the leaves of the plants shone so green they almost hurt Lena's eyes. On the day when she'd come here with her father, Lena had spent hours wandering along the gravel paths that ran between the vegetable beds sniffing the leaves, poking her fingers into the dirt, and learning to tell the plants apart by their look and smell. There were the beans and peas with their curly tendrils, the dark green spinach and ruffled lettuce, and the hard pale green cabbages, some of them big as a newborn baby's head. What she loved best was to rub the leaves of the tomato plant between her fingers and breathe in their pungent, powdery smell. A long, straight path led from one end of the building to the other. About halfway down the path, Cleary was crouching by a bed of carrots. Lena ran toward her and Cleary smiled, brushed the dirt from her hands, and stood up. Cleary was tall and solid with big hands and knobby knuckles. She had a square jaw and square shoulders and brown hair cut in a short, squarish way. You might have thought from looking at her that she was a gruff, unfriendly person, but her nature was just the opposite. She was more comfortable with plants than with people. Lena's father has always said, she was strong but shy, a person of much knowledge but few words. Lena had always liked her. Even when she was little, Cleary did not treat her like a baby, but gave her jobs to do, pulling up carrots, picking bugs off cabbages. Since her parents had died, Lena had come many times to talk with Cleary, or just to work silently beside her. Cleary was always kind to her, and working with plants took Lena's mind off her grief. Well, said Cleary, she smiled at Lena, wiped her hands on her already grimy pants, and smiled some more. Finally, she said, You're a messenger? Yes, said Lena, and I have a message for you from Arvin Schwinn. Please add four extra crates to my order, two of potatoes and two of cabbages. Cleary frowned. I can't do that, she said. At least I can send him the cabbages, but only one small crate of potatoes. Why? asked Lena. Well, we have a sort of problem with the potatoes. What is it? asked Lena. Cleary had a habit of answering questions in the briefest possible way. You had to keep asking and asking before she would believe you really wanted to know and weren't just being polite. Then she would explain, and you could see how much she knew and how much she loved her work. I'll show you, she said. She let the way to the bed where the green leaves were spotted with black. A new disease. I haven't seen it before. When you dig up the potatoes, they're runny inside instead of hard. And they stink. I'm going to have to throw out all the ones in this bed. There are only a few beds left that aren't infected. Most people in Ember had potatoes at every meal. Mashed, boiled, stewed, roasted. They had fried potatoes, too, in those days before cooking oil ran out. I'd hate if we couldn't have potatoes anymore, Lena said. I would, too, said Cleary. They sat on the edge of the potato bed and talked for a while. About Lena's grandmother and the baby, about the trouble Cleary was having with the beehives, and about the greenhouse sprinkler system. It hasn't worked right since. 
Cleary hesitated, glancing sideways at Lena. For a long time, she said. She didn't want to say, since your father died. Lena understood that. She stood up. I should go, she said. I have to take Arben Schwinn the answer to his message. I hope you'll come again, said Cleary. You can come whenever. You can come any time. Lena said thank you and turned to go. But just outside the greenhouse door, she heard running footsteps and a strange, high, sobbing sound. Or rather, she heard sobs and then a wail. Sobs and then a shout and then more sobs getting louder. She looked back towards the rear of the greenhouses, towards the trash heaps. Cleary, she called. There's something. Cleary came out and listened, too. Do you hear it? Yes, said Cleary. She frowned. I'm afraid it's... It's someone who... She peered towards the crying noise. Yes, here he comes. Her strong hand gripped Lena's shoulder for a moment. You'd better go, she said. I'll take care of this. But what is it? Never mind. Just go on. But Lena wanted to see. Once Cleary had walked away, she ducked behind the tool shed from where she watched. The noise came closer. Out beyond the trash heaps, a figure appeared. It was a man running and stumbling, his arms flopping. He looked as if he was about to fall over and as if he could hardly pick up his feet. In fact, as he came closer, he did fall. He tripped over a hose and crumpled to the ground as if his bones had dissolved. Cleary stooped down and said something to him in a voice too low for Lena to hear. The man was panting. When he turned over and sat up, Lena saw his face was scratched and his eyes wide open in fright. His sobs had turned into hiccups. She recognized him. It was Sage Merrill, one of the clerks in the supply depot. He was a quiet, long-faced man who always looked worried. Cleary helped him to his feet. The two of them came slowly toward the greenhouse, and as they got closer, Lena could hear what the man was saying. He spoke very fast in a weak, trembly voice, hardly stopping for a breath. I was sure I could do it. I said to myself, just one step after another. That's all. One step after another. I knew it would be dark. Who doesn't know that? But I thought, well, dark can't hurt you. I'll just keep going, I thought. He stumbled and sagged against Cleary. Careful, Cleary said. They reached the door of the greenhouse, and Cleary struggled to open it. Without thinking, Lena darted out from behind the tool shed and opened it for her. Cleary shot her a quick frown, but said nothing. Sadge didn't stop talking. But then, the farther I went, the darker it was, and you just can't keep walking into black dark, can you? It's like a wall in front of you. I kept turning around to look and see the lights of the city, because that's all there was to see. And then I'd say to myself, don't look back, keep moving. But I kept tripping and falling. The ground is rough out there. I scraped my hands. He held up one hand and stared at the red scratches on it, which oozed drops of blood. They got him into Cleary's office and sat him down on the chair. He rambled on. Be brave, I said to myself. I kept going and going, but then, all of a sudden, I thought, anything could happen out here. There could be a pit a thousand feet deep right in front of me. There could be something that bites. I've heard stories. Big rats. Big as garbage bins. And I had to get out of there. So I turned around and I ran. Never mind, said Cleary. You're all right now. Lena, get him some water. Lena found a cup and filled it from the sink in the corner. Sadge took it with a shaking hand and drank it down. What were you looking for? Lena asked. She knew what she would have been looking for if she'd gone out there. She'd thought about it countless times. Sadge stared at her. He seemed to to puzzle over the question. Finally, he said, I was looking for something that could help us. What would it be? I don't know. Like a stairway that leads somewhere or something. Or a building full of, I don't know, useful things. But you didn't find anything or see anything, Lena asked, disappointed. Nothing, nothing. There was nothing out there. His voice became a shout and his eyes looked wild again. Or if there is, we can never get to it. Never! Not without a light. He took a long, shaky breath. For a while, he stared at the floor. Then he stood up. I think I'm all right now. I'll be going. With uncertain steps, he went down the path out the door. Well, said Cleary. I'm sorry that happened while you were here. I was afraid you might be scared. That's why I told you to go. Belina was full of questions, not fear. 
She had heard the tales of people who tried to go out into the unknown regions. She had thought about it herself, in fact. She had wondered the same things as Sage. She had imagined making her way out into the dark and coming to a wall in which she would find the door to a tunnel, and at the edge of the tunnel would be another city, the city of light that she had dreamed about. All it would take was the courage to walk from Enver and into the darkness, and then to keep going. It might have been possible if you could carry a light to show the way, but in Enver there was no such thing as a light you could carry with you. Outside lights were fixed to their poles, or to the roofs of houses. Inside lights were set into ceilings or had cords that had to be plugged in. Over the course of Enver's history, various clever people had tried to invent a movable light, but all of them had failed. One man had managed to ignite the end of a stick by, of wood by holding it against the electric burner on his stove. He had run across the city with the flaming stick, planning to use it to light his journey. But by the time he got to the trash heaps, his torch had gone out. Other people latched on to his idea. One woman who lived in Deadlock Street, very near the edge of the city, managed to get into the unknown regions with her flaming stick. But the stick burned quickly, and before she could go far... The flame singed her hands, and she threw it down. Everyone who had tried to penetrate the unknown regions had come back within a few hours, their enterprise a failure. Lena and Cleary stood by the open door of the greenhouse and watched Sag shuffle down toward the city. As he neared the trash heaps, two guards who had been sitting on the ground got to their feet. They walked over to Sag, and each of them took hold of one of his arms. Uh oh, said Cleary. Those guards are always looking for trouble. Besides, she hasn't broken any law, said Lena. Doesn't matter. They need something to do. They'll get some fun out of scaring him. One of the guards was shaking his finger at Sag and saying something in a voice almost loud enough for Lena to hear. <sighs> Poor man, said Cleary with a sigh. He's the fourth one this year. The guards were marching Sag away now, one on either side of him. Sag looked limp and small between them. What do you think is out in the unknown regions, Cleary? Cleary stared down at the ground, where the light from the greenhouse was casting long, thin shadows of them both. I don't know. Nothing, I guess. And do you think Ember's the only light in the dark world? Cleary sighed. I don't know, she said. She gave Lena a long look. Her eyes, Lena thought, looked a little sad. They were a deep brown, almost the color of the earth in the garden bed. Clary put a hand in her pocket and drew something out. Look, she said. In the palm of her hand was a white bean. Something in this seed knows how to make a bean plant. How does it know that? I don't know, said Lena, staring at the hard, flat bean. It knows because it has life in it, said Cleary. But where does life come from? What is life? Lena could see that the words were welling up in Cleary now. Her eyes were bright. Her cheeks were rosy. Take a lamp, for instance. When you plug it in, it comes alive, in a way. It lights up. That's because it's connected to a wire that's connected to the generator, which is making electricity. Though don't ask me how. But a bean seed isn't connected to anything. Neither are people. We don't have plugs and wires that connect us to generators. What makes living things go is inside them somehow. Her dark eyebrows drew together over her eyes. What I mean is, she said, finally. Something is going on that we don't understand. They say that the builders made the city, but who made the builders? Who made us? I think the answer must be somewhere outside of Ember. In the unknown regions? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. She brushed her hands back together in a time to get back to work way. Cleary, said Lena quickly. Here's what I think. Her heart sped up. She hadn't told this to anyone before. In my mind, I see another city. Lena watched to see if Cleary was going to laugh at her or smile in the overly kind way. She didn't, so Lena went on. It isn't like Ember. It's white and gleaming. The buildings are tall and sort of sparkle. Everything's bright, not just inside the buildings, but all around them, too, even up in the sky. I know, it's just my imagination, but it feels real. I think it is real, Cleary said. Hmm... And then she said, where would such a city be? That's what I don't know. Or how to get to it. I keep thinking there's a door somewhere, maybe out in the unknown regions, a door that leads out of Ember, and then behind the door, a road. 
Clear just shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, she said. I have to get back to work. But here, take this. She handed Lena the bean seed, took a little pot from a shelf, scooped some dirt into it, and handed the pot to Lena, too. Stick the bean in here and water it every day, she said. It looks like nothing, like a little white stone, but inside it there's life. That must be sort of a clue, don't you think? If we could just figure it out. Lena took the seed and the pot. Thank you, she said. She wanted to give Clary a hug, but didn't, in case it would embarrass her. Instead, she just said goodbye and raced back toward the city.